Hello and welcome to Network Beyond Bias. I'm the host for your webinar. My name is Amy C. Wanninger. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself and about the content that you're about to hear. So I am the author of the book, Network Beyond Bias, Making Diversity a Competitive Advantage for Your Career. I wrote this book because I felt like there was a missing element in the literature on diversity and inclusion that left out everyday people from the conversation. So there was a lot in the marketplace about what to do if you're the executive of a company, what to do if you are in the HR department, how to make policies and you know, do effective recruiting and, you know, set, um, you know, set work cultures that make a difference for um, people from diverse backgrounds. But what was missing, in my opinion, was a manual for the rest of us, what each of us as individuals can do to be more inclusive, but also why we would want to and how that can be important to our careers. A little about me, I am a professional member of the National Speakers Association and I am a ProSci certified change practitioner. I have over a decade of progressive management experience in the IT and insurance industries. And a lot of the examples that I use in the book um, and in this webinar are drawn from my own experience as well as the people that I've worked with over the past 20 years of my career. Um, I also have two degrees from Indiana University and a world's best coffee, world's best mom coffee mug. So I am a working mother, and I think it's important to call that out because one of the things that makes me feel included um, is not having to downplay my family responsibilities, but actually embracing that in the workplace. Now we're going to jump into some content. Are you ready? So I want you to imagine at the end of this session, you had to make a really important decision for your career. It could be approaching your next client, finding your next mentor, or hiring the next person for your team. Think for a moment about how much information would you need of the available information to make a good decision for your career. Would you need 100%, 50%, 5%? When I do this session live, I often ask this question, and I ask people to stand up at the beginning and sit down when they're no longer confident they can make a good decision. I usually lose people around the 50% or 20% mark. When I get to 1% or 2%, there's no one left standing. And when I get to 3 tenths of 1%, I guarantee no one is left standing in the room. No one is confident they can make a decision with only 3 ten thousandths of the information available to make that decision. And certainly no one wants anyone else doing this for their careers. However, our brains are making those kinds of judgments every second of every day. Your brain can handle about 11 million pieces of information per second, but your conscious thought capacity is only 40 pieces of information per, se per second. So that means every second of every day, you're discarding 99.9997% of the available information. I want you to think about the decisions you make in those seconds where to sit, what to eat, whether to start a conversation with a stranger, or what to say when you do. You're making these little tiny decisions every second of every day with just three ten thousandths of a percent of the available information. Your brain considers what's relevant to you in the moment and discards everything else. So you may be listening intently to my voice right now and you don't recognize that something's moving across the room. Or you may notice that something's moving across the room and you didn't hear the last 20 seconds of what I just said. Maybe your foot itches or you have a toothache or you're worried about paying your mortgage and your mind's on that. We all go through this. We have these moments where we just can't focus on everything at once and we're, we're cognizant of it. But what is true and what we need to keep in mind is that this happens all the time even when we're not conscious of it. Your brain can't be everywhere at once. So it tries to focus on whatever it perceives at that moment as important, interesting, or a potential threat. So what your brain does next is even more important to your decision-making process. The feeling part of the brain, the amygdala, reacts to those 11 million sensory inputs in that second before the thinking part of your brain has time to respond. So you feel before you think. I want you to imagine that you're driving down a road late at night, deserted highway, and all of a sudden you look up and you notice police cruiser lights are in your rear view mirror. What's the first thing you notice about yourself? 
So if you're like me, your heart starts racing immediately and your foot comes off the gas. And then you start to ask all these questions. Was I speeding? Do, you know, do I have a tail light out? Are my plates out of date? You know, trying to come up with a story about why this police cruiser's lights are on behind your car late at night on a, on a deserted road. And even after, I'm going to let you off the hook, but even after the police cruiser pulls past you and goes on to a real emergency, it may take a while for your heart rate to settle back down. So let's think about what's happening here. You perceived a threat. And then your amygdala kicked into action. But the thinking part of your brain wondered what's going on. Why am I nervous? Why is my foot all, all of a sudden off the gas? Why is my heart racing? Why am I sweating? And so it starts asking these questions about your driver's license and your, your speed to tell yourself a story to explain why you feel the way you do. So your thinking is always trying to catch up to your feeling. Now, this is a situation that most of us can relate to in some way. But what's interesting to me is that we do this all the time. We feel before we think and we don't realize we're doing it. And so if we don't realize we're doing it, our feelings and our gut reactions are in the driver's seat unless we intervene. So it's worth understanding where these gut reactions and initial feelings come from. Well, they come from deeply held biases, deeply held preferences for or against certain things. And that's all bias is, is a preference for one thing over another. We're hardwired for this. This is part of our biology because when we lived in caves and, you know, every time we stepped out of the cave, we had to decide if the next thing we saw was something we could eat for our survival or something that was going to eat us and threaten our survival. We had to know if each new person we met was in our tribe or not in our tribe, because these were split second life and death decisions. So people who were more similar to us, who were familiar to us, who matched the patterns in our brains, were less of a threat than people who were different or experiences that were different. And despite all of our cultural and social and intellectual adaptations, this biology still guides our thoughts and actions. Bias starts very early in our lives. It starts in our infancy. So babies as young as six months old will demonstrate a preference for people of their own race. And even younger than that, babies show a preference for attractive faces, meaning more symmetrical faces, than unattractive or asymmetrical ones. And this is only the beginning. So as you can imagine, as we grow up and we're socialized toward experiences that bring us pleasure and away from experiences that cause us pain, we start to develop values in the, con in the context of the society, the family structure, the school, the educational system, the legal system around us. We start to adopt these things as universal truths, not realizing that if we stepped outside of our community or outside of our family or outside of our country, that our values or priorities, if you can think about values as priorities, are not universal. In fact, they're, we're very likely to come into conflict with others because our values and priorities are different from theirs. But for each of us, our socialization in the environment that we find ourselves in growing up is not complete until we've internalized all of the expectations of our communities. So if you think about the rules that you have to follow in school or, you know, when your parents put you in timeout when you're a child or, you know, if you're a parent and you put your child in timeout, you're teaching them rules, you're socializing them. And those rules are based on values or priorities that come from the dominant culture, culture around you, the educational system, the legal system. Okay. As we develop physically, emotionally, and socially, we start to shape these values and these identities into a sense of self. And the way our sense of self works is unique to each of us because the world responds to each of us differently based on how we come into the world. So a female child is treated much differently than a male child. A child that is athletic is treated much differently than a child who is not athletic. If you were like me and you were last picked in kickball every single time for 12 years of elementary school, middle school, and high school, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Our experience is different if, if we're a nerd or if we're a jock. Our experience of the world is different if we like football or ballet. Our experience of the world is different if we, you know, are, we grow up in the Midwest or we grow up on the West Coast. 
right? All of these things play in if we come from a different country. All of these things give us a sense of identity. And so we start to develop this sense of identity or belonging based on how we, how we dress, how we speak, the kinds of foods we eat, the sorts of things that we're interested in. And we start to form a sense of community around those preferences in addition to our shared values. So as we start to firm this up, we start to see others through this lens of our own self-identity, our own self-perception. And we start to make judgments, and I'm using that word on purpose, about others relative to us. So, for example, your definition of success was probably much different five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago than it is today. And the reason your definition of success is different is because you're different. And so what you see as successful changes after you reach that definition of success. But as you look at others, you may see them through that same lens and with that same criteria that's changing over time. The way you see when you say someone's a really good person, what you typically mean is that person's values or behaviors or manners align with my own. And so we tend to judge people as good or bad based on how similar they are to us or how similar they are to our aspirational selves. Here's the important part. When we get to experiences, we tend to choose our experiences in ways that reinforce our values, our identities, and our perceptions of others. So I'm going to guess that if you are a football fan, I would not find you at the opera on Super Bowl Sunday. And I'm going to guess that if you are, you know, a, a huge uh, fan of the ballet and the fine arts, that if you know, the, the Russian ballet company comes to town on a Saturday, you're not going to be fishing. You're going to be at the ballet, right? You're going to choose an identity or a, an experience that matches your identity. And you're going to collect with other people to share those experiences because they have a shared identity, shared values, shared priorities and preferences. And that's all fine. But what we do, what we tend to do if we aren't conscious of it, is we only choose experiences for ourselves that reinforce those other aspects of who we are and what we believe. And then we only tend to hang around with people who choose those same experiences based on similar values, identities, and perceptions of others. And so what happens is our world becomes very, very small because we're only reinforcing these things and we're not challenging, we're not expanding, we're not making our world bigger. We do not have to limit ourselves in this way. And when we do this over and over and over again, it becomes so automatic that our preferences or biases become unconscious rather than choices that we make. They're just default behaviors. So we don't have to limit ourselves. We can choose to break the cycle of getting smaller and smaller and smaller in the world. We can choose to open ourselves up to new perspectives, more varied experiences, and even conflicting ideas. Although I would advise you, stay away from the comments section. No matter how much you want to expand your horizon, the comments section is not a place to do it on any social media anywhere ever. But we can choose to explore, try on different values and identities. In other words, we can choose to grow. And it's these conscious choices rather than our gut reactions that make us leaders instead of followers, that make us heroes of our own story instead of victims of circumstance instead of followers of the crowd. So how do we do this? Well, having the power to break out of unconscious bias is one thing, but wielding this power isn't easy. It's simple. It's not easy. You're going to have to recognize your own biases. You're going to have to confront some of your assumptions and challenge some of your beliefs. You may even have to change how you see yourself in order to see others in a new way. This requires honesty, integrity, and vulnerability. But remember, this is the work of leaders. If it were easy, everyone would do it, and it wouldn't be leadership. I'm going to give you three simple steps for overcoming unconscious bias. Now, again, I said they're simple, but they're not always easy. The first one is to put yourself on notice. Now, what I mean by this is notice your responses, your reactions, your gut feelings to stimuli around you. 
one thing I love wor about working with other people is that you will see all kinds of different reactions to change in the workplace. So, for example, if they decided that they were going to make all of the parking spots at your at your work, you know, from they were going to move them from angled parking spots to perpendicular parking spots, there would be probably about a third of the people that were like completely up in arms about this because they absolutely hate perpendicular parking spots. You would have about a third of the people that would be totally on board because they love perpendicular parking spots. And then you'd have people in the middle who are either like they don't care or they just want to have more information about why, or you know, you're going to get, if you have five people in a room, you're going to get five different responses. And so let's say you're the kind of person who had a really bad accident in a parking lot where someone was backing out of a perpendicular spot. And you're going to come into that with that experience and maybe an identity associated with that. And you're going to have a reaction, maybe a negative reaction to that announcement. And somebody else in the room is going to have a completely different set of experiences, identities, values that they're going to bring to that same announcement. So they're going to respond a little bit differently. Just noticing your response, knowing where that comes from, can make a huge difference in how you ultimately conduct yourself in a given situation. The second step is to observe the responses of others. So again, if I say, wow, I really don't like perpendicular parking spots because when I was a kid, I almost got hit by a car because somebody was backing out of a perpendicular spot. And I've, you know, just constantly thought about how dangerous those spots are. I can notice that I'm having a fear reaction or an anger reaction in that moment. But I may notice somebody else is really excited about it. I may notice somebody else wants more information. And so what I can do by observing the responses of others is file those different responses away for future reference. I can build kind of a database, if you will, in my brain of responses to different parking lot configurations. And this is a simple example, but I think it, you know, it makes some sense if you put it in a context of some change that you're going through at work. And I'll share one of mine in a moment. The third piece, and this is the most important, is to press your pause button. Now, everybody has a pause button. It's actually a physical spot on your body, and it's called your philtrum. Most people don't know what it is, where it is, or what it's for, but I'm going to tell you what it is, where it is, and what it's for right now. What it is is this little divot under your nose above your upper lip. And if you have a mustache, it's the place in the middle where the hair doesn't grow. And if you don't have a mustache, it's the place in the middle that you don't have to wax. Okay, so the pause button or philtrum is this little spot under your nose and there is actually a medical reason we have one it's something to do with our sense of smell and you know driving particles efficiently into our nostrils or something but what i want you to use it for from this point forward that you've never thought about this piece of your face before is to put the tip of your index finger right there on your pause button and think about what are you doing when you do that well if you're doing it right it looks like you're thinking and if you're doing it right, you're not talking. And in that space between stimulus and response, where you put your finger on your pause button, literally, it gives you time to go back through that database of all the responses that you've observed from others. And you can then pick the one that's the most important or the most productive in that situation. And it's going to be different every time. Because the context may change. Even though the stimulus is the same, the context may be different. And I'll give you an example. So when I was right out of college, I, my first degree, I'm sorry, my second degree was in computer science. And when I was right out of college, it was uh, right before the Y2K, um, you know, the, all the companies were staffing up for Y2K programmers because we, they needed us to fix this COBOL code where all of the years were two digits and they needed to go to four digits or all of the computer systems were going to crash and the world was coming to an end. And if you're old enough to remember that, you probably know what I'm talking about. And so I got out of school in 2000, but I started my first job in 1999 and I didn't get hired for COBOL, but it was part of that whole tech thing, you know, that tech launch tech bubble that, that built up around Y2K. And when that was over, um, I got laid off. And, you know, I was just out of school. I was maybe two years out of school. I was six months pregnant. I had just bought a house. I was panicked 
because here I had been making, you know, making really good money for me at that time, you know, in a job that I thought was going to be around forever. I'd gone to school, you know, I'd gone back to school for a degree in computer science so that I would have the skill set. And I found out my job was going away and I was absolutely panicked. What was I going to do? Would I lose my house? Would I have to move in with my, you know, would I have to move my family in with my parents? Would, you know, what, like, what would I do? And I was terrified. I didn't know if anybody would hire me because it's so obviously pregnant. I was absolutely scared. And, you know, I got another job eventually and it, you know, didn't lose the house and, and all of the horrible stuff that I feared. Most of it didn't happen, right? But in the years that followed, there were more bubbles and bursts in the tech industry. And, you know, like the fourth or fifth time I got laid off from a job, I thought, man, this really stinks. And so, you know, I, I got, we got called into a conference room one day, a couple jobs later and, um, and management said, well, you know, we're, we're going to outsource all of the development positions and we're going to move all these jobs overseas. And you can either stick around for the next six months, get a severance at the end of it, or you can look for another job now. That's your choice. We just want to let you know this is coming. And I was so scared again. And, you know, I, I looked around and I thought, well, everybody else around me isn't scared. You know, there was a guy that saw the writing on the wall. He was already lining up another job. There was somebody else that had, excuse me, that had a recruiter that he called immediately because he, he had been through this so many times that he just knew what to do. There were people that were excited because they were going to use their severance uh, paycheck to start a new business. And so, you know, all these different reactions to the same stimulus of your job is going away in six months. And I sat there and I thought, wow, you know, they're really brave. And I wonder why they're not afraid. And I thought, well, they're not afraid because they're not six months pregnant. They're not just out of college. You know, they have established networks in the industry and around town and they know people. And then I stopped and I thought about it. I thought, you know, I've been in my career a good seven or eight years now. I've been through this before. I'm not six months pregnant this time. I have a pretty good network around town and in the industry. Maybe I don't have to be afraid anymore either. And so even though the stimulus didn't change for me, it was still losing my job. The context had changed. I was no longer pregnant. I had more experience. I had good market value. I had a network. You know, I could make something of this. And so if I hadn't been able to notice that I was relying on old information and observe that other people were making a different decision or having a different response and really sitting there thinking about what was I going to do differently? Could I, could I make a different choice? Um, I think I would have been stuck in this cycle forever. And what I ultimately did was I, I worked through a process that's going to be part of my second book that will, um, that has helped me when I've been in these positions where it helps me analyze what do I know? What do I not know? How can I learn it? And what can I do to move forward? And as a result of that decision, as a result of sitting down, pressing my pause button and thinking about what was going on around me and what options were available to me in response to this, this event, I was able to move into a different role that led to a management position, that led to a consulting position, that led to a management position in a Fortune 100 company. And it really changed the entire trajectory of my career just following these three steps. Now, I didn't have these steps laid out at the time, but looking back, this is exactly what I did. So, you know, just noticing how you feel, observing what other people are doing, and what experiences or identities they may be bringing to the situation that are different from your own. And then picking, press your pause button, and picking the most productive response can make a huge difference, not just in the moment, but in the long term. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about what does this mean for networking? Because a lot of people say, well, yeah, that's great that you can make a great decision for your career, but what does this have to do with networking? And again, I want to remind you that we tend to pick our default behaviors, not because we know that they're there, but because we don't know any better, because we haven't chosen to break out of that cycle. And often, because we choose experiences that match our identities and we make decisions that reinforce our values and our experiences, and we tend to congregate with people who share those values and experiences and identities, 
we can often miss really big opportunities for ourselves and our careers and for our companies because we don't realize who's not in the room. And so I want to tell you a little story because sometimes it's hard to see this in your own network, but I'm going to tell you a story about some, some imaginary friends of mine at a company called Hard Nugget. Now, one thing that makes me different, and I'll tell you right now, one thing that makes me different from a lot of people is that I'm an only child. So I grew up with a lot of imaginary friends because not only was I, was I an only child, but I grew up an only child in a rural area. So it wasn't like I could just walk to a friend's house when I was a kid. So I spent a lot of time by myself. So I'm not really embarrassed to say that I have imaginary friends, but I thought I should explain that to you today. So these are my imaginary friends, and they work in an imaginary company called Hard Noggin. And they've noticed a problem in Hard Noggin where stuff tends to fall off of shelves. And when it falls off of the shelves and hits them on their heads, it hurts really a lot. And so they decided, hey, we're going to do something to fix this. So my imaginary friends at Hard Noggin all got together, and they came up with this brilliant idea that they were going to wear Hard Noggin hard hats. And they found a supplier and they're ready to go. And everyone is super excited about this decision. Well, almost everyone is super excited about this decision. And why do I say almost everyone? Well, Fred is new to hard noggin. And, you know, Fred hears about this hard noggin policy. He's like, oh, wow, that's great that they're trying to solve that problem. I really wish they would have asked me because I've got an opinion about that but I'm new. So they probably didn't want to bother me with it while I was doing all of my orientation and all my new hire paperwork and while I was getting trained on where to find things at Hard Noggin. So, you know, I, I guess that's okay. But then he starts thinking about it a little bit longer. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm sure that if they thought about it for just a second, they would know that this isn't going to work for me. Now, nobody said anything in the interview process, and nobody said anything since Fred started at Hard Noggin, but it would be hard not to notice. Fred has a flat head. Now, you know, nobody wants to be rude about it, so they haven't brought it up. But Fred wonders if maybe he was not included in this decision, not because he's new, but because he's different. And now he doesn't know what to do. He's afraid because this has happened to him before. He's afraid that if he says something to his coworkers, that they'll get really defensive. And he's afraid if he says something, he's going to be calling out how different he is. And he doesn't want to do that because he's new and he just wants to fit in and be, you know, be one of the hard noggin team. And so, you know, he thinks about, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything. Maybe I should just try to wear the hat. But he realizes pretty quickly that the hat's just going to fall right off of his big flat head. And he doesn't know what to do. Should he spend all day picking up the hat? That's going to really, you know, hamper his productivity. And then he thinks, well, maybe I could wear two hats. But if I wear two hats, they might think I'm flaunting my flat head. So he's really not sure what to do. So he does what all of us do when we're not sure what to do about something at work. He goes home and he talks to his family. Now, Fred, because he's like the rest of us in this way, most of his family and friends have flat heads because they have similar life experiences and they understand each other and they have a shared identity and they have shared values and they shop at the same stores. And so when he goes, to, when he goes home to his family and it talks to his friends, he gets all kinds of different advice about what he should do. Some people say, oh, Fred, you got to talk to them. They need to know about this. And he's like, well, isn't it obvious that I have a flat head and those hats are not going to fit me? And then someone else says, well, you're going to have to figure it out because if you don't figure it out and find a way to make this work, how are your kids ever going to survive in an industry like Hard Noggin because they have flat heads too? And Fred says, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. You know, I've got to be a trailblazer for, for flat headed people in this industry, in this company. And then he has some other friends that say, now, they're trying to tell you something. They're trying to tell you they don't really want you there. And they're trying to get you to leave. And he says, well, I don't think so because they just hired me. Why would they do that? And, you know, some other people say, Fred, I really think you should just go work for a place that understands people with flat heads and understands our needs. And so Fred really doesn't know what to do. So he sits on the decision for a while. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity opens up in management. 
And Fred decides he's going to apply because he thinks, well, maybe if I can get into management, I can make this place a little bit more flat-headed friendly. And so he applies to a management role and he doesn't get the job. Now, the person that got the job was qualified. You know, Fred had a few more qualifications or maybe about the same qualifications, but he wasn't chosen. And so he doesn't know if that has anything to do with his flat head or with his tenure with the company because he is still fairly new. But he decides, okay, maybe, maybe that had nothing to do with, with me or my flat head. Maybe that was just this job. And so then one day he notices that he's all alone in the cafeteria when he's eating his lunch. And then someone comes over to talk to him. He gets excited. He's like, oh, wow. Okay, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. And Judy comes over and Judy says, hey, Fred, are you coming to the company picnic on Saturday? And Fred says, well, I haven't really decided. He's trying to be diplomatic, but he knows that it's all going to be party games with hats for round-headed people. And so he says, well, I don't know. I haven't decided if I'm going to be there or not. She goes, oh, Fred, you got to come. Be there or be square. And now Fred's pretty ticked off because he thinks, okay, this is intentional. And so now Hard Noggin has a lawsuit on their hands and they've got bad publicity. And their PR people are out there trying to say, no, 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 we had no idea that we, you know, we were discriminating or we had policies that discriminated against people with flat heads. And Fred has example after example after example of ways that he's been excluded at work. Now, let's assume that his round-headed friends had no idea this policy would affect him differently. Should they have known? Well, probably. But if they didn't have a familiarity with people with flatheads, because they'd never really been around that many people with flatheads, then they probably wouldn't know that this was an issue for Fred, that the hats wouldn't fit him. And so as they go on about their day having their round-headed conversations, they don't even realize they're doing it. Well, what happens at Hard Noggin? There's this us versus them that starts to build. And, you know, now they can't hire anybody with a flat head because, you know, all the flat-headed community knows that Hard Noggin's just not a place for them. And so I know this is a silly example with imaginary friends, but if you think about things that you're hearing in the news, that you're seeing in the paper about companies that are making horrible missteps because they don't represent the communities where they do business or because they don't understand how policies affect different workers differently or because they are tone deaf to what's going on in the world around them, you know, it's not a difficult stretch to think that there are some companies that could really benefit from examining their round-headed conversations. Now, a lot of times when I give this talk, people will say, oh, but I don't have any round-headed conversations, Amy. I have lots and lots of flat-headed friends. Some of my best friends have flat heads. And that may be true, but I'm going to give you a tool today to help you analyze that and help you figure out if that's true. Okay? And so I call this your CHAMP network. And I want you to network like a champ. So I'm going to talk about first the five critical connections you need in your career for longevity of your career to kind of fireproof yourself in case you're in a situation like I was where I kept losing my job um, because of the, you know, just the rapid change in the industry that I was in. And the, um, you know, just the depth of your network to make sure that you're getting as broad a view as possible for your career. So we're going to talk about networking like a champ. Now each, I love word puzzles. So each letter of champ stands for someone you need in your network. And you can play along at home. If you have a, a pencil and paper, just write this down. Okay. All right. So C stands for customer. If you have a customer for your company or your industry that is outside of your company, so internal customers do not count for this exercise. I'll explain that in a minute. A customer that you have spoken with in the last three months, I want you to put their name in the C line on your sheet, okay? Now, my customer's name is Chris. The reason I don't want you to put someone inside your company is because that person has a round head, just like you. They have the same biases, they have the same lingo, they have the same insider knowledge. So even if they're a customer of your company, let's say you work for a retail store 
and your best friend that at work only shops at that retail store, yes, they're a customer of the retail store, but they know all the stuff you know about what goes on behind the scenes. So what I'm looking for is a perspective outside of your company or organization. Now, if you're not a, an organization that has customers, think about C as constituents. So maybe you work in the public sector, maybe you work in healthcare, maybe you're part of an association or on the board of directors for a not-for-profit, but think about the constituents. So the people who use the services or who would, you know, who would be the benefactors of the services that, that your organization provides. And if you haven't spoken with somebody who fits that category in the last three months, just leave that spot blank. The H is somebody you've hired or helped get a job in the last three months. Now, if you're not a hiring manager, that's okay. A warm referral counts. So if you've referred someone to a recruiter, if you've introduced someone to a hiring manager, if you've written a letter of recommendation or a recommendation on someone's LinkedIn profile, for example, if you've helped someone get a job, put their name in the H line. For me, that's Adrian. Now, if you haven't done this in the last three months, I want you to leave the spot blank and I want you to think about all of the goodwill you could create by helping someone in your network who's looking for a job. And I'm gonna leave that right there. Okay, the A is for an associate. An associate is a peer, somebody at your same level, not necessarily in your company, but somebody at your same level, that when you're having a bad day and you need to bounce ideas off of someone, or when your boss has asked you to do something that you just don't understand why, or you know something catastrophic happened at work, and you really need to go out for coffee or maybe something a little stronger, you know, for happy hour, this is the person that you call to tell all your troubles to and get some ideas. So somebody at your same level is an associate. My associate's name is John. The next person you need for your network is a mentor. A mentor is someone who knows something you do not and who can teach you that something, okay? Someone who's, you know, even five minutes ahead of you in your career can tell you good places to step and places you don't want to put your feet. Okay. My mentor's name is Stephanie. Now, again, if you don't have an associate or a mentor, just leave these spots blank. That's fine. You can, that can be part of your homework to fill these spots in. The last person you need in your network is a protege. A protege is someone that you're mentoring, that you're helping develop in their career. Now, and mine is Jackie. Even if you're brand new in the workforce, even if you haven't started work yet, you can mentor someone, you can have a protege. So when I do this talk at colleges, you know, they say, well, I, I don't know how to, I can't mentor anyone. I, I, I'm not even in my field yet. Well, you know, at the college level, I say you, you're doing two things that a lot of people don't know how to do. Number one, you've graduated from high school. And number two, you've kept yourself out of jail. And there are high schools and there are prisons in just about every community in this country. And those people could use a mentor. Um, if you're in high school and you're listening to this, you know, you could be a tutor for someone in middle school or grade school. You could be a big brother or big sister maybe, or a volunteer at a YMCA program. So there's always someone behind you that needs to see that you've been through what they've been through, that you've gotten to the other side of it okay, and that you can help give some guidance to. I'm going to tell you a secret about mentoring and having a protege. It's not just for them. You get amazing benefits when you mentor someone else. It helps you, you know, get more confident in your skills. It helps you learn what skills you have that are marketable or maybe desirable by other people. It may help you, um, you know, it may help you grow in your career if you can teach someone else how to do something. So there are all sorts of benefits to having a protege. You're going to get as much out of that relationship as you give, I promise. And it is so important because, you know, just like you need somebody showing you the way forward, you can be that someone for someone else. Okay. So right now I want you to just kind of take a moment to reflect how full is your champ network? If you have all five, that's great. And if you don't, I want you to spend some time thinking about how you might cultivate those relationships. Someone in, who's a customer or a constituent that you might reach out to on a regular basis to get their insights. Someone that you could hire or help get a job. An associate or someone that you could be, you know, have a kind of a peer relationship with at work. Someone who can mentor you and someone 
whom you can mentor that can serve as your protege. In the next step, we're going to talk about what perspectives does your network ignore? And so looking at the word ignore, again, it's a word game and it stands for each, each letter of ignore stands for a different characteristic that someone in your network can have. And I'm going to start out by saying this is not an exhaustive list. And when I get to the end, you're going to say, oh, but what about, you know, what about this and what about that? And that's fine. The more diversity you can bring into your network, the better, because you're going to get different perspectives. You're going to know when you're having a roundheaded conversation and you're leaving someone out. But let's just try just a few of these, okay? So the first one is industry. So for each of your champs, I'd like for you to put an X in the, in the I column if that person is in a different industry than you are. In the first G column, which stands for generation, I want you to put an X in the box if that person is at least 10 years older or 10 years younger than you. I also want you to think about if you have a mentor, is that person older than you? And should they be? And do they have to be? Could you benefit from a mentor who is 10 years younger than you? Could you be a mentor to someone who is older than you or has more years of experience than you? Could you mentor them in some new aspect of your work or your industry or your job or your company? Okay. And again, this is if they're different from you. Okay. This, the next G is for gender or gender identity. So I am a cisgender female. And cisgender means, for those who don't know, cisgender means that when I was born, the doctor said, it's a girl. And the doctor was right. But that's not everybody's experience. And so I would put an X in the, in the second G column for anyone who is not a cisgender female. So whatever your gender identity, put an X in the box for those that are different from you. The N column stands for national origin or native language. Now, I'm from the Midwest, and I'm from a very rural part of the Midwest. So where I grew up, there were not a lot of, there, not a lot of people moved into my area from other places. It was a place people wanted to move out of, usually. And so, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of exposure to people from different countries when I was growing up. And that's something that I've had to work really hard as an adult, but you'll see in a moment that I need to work even harder at it. So if, you, if somebody in your CHAMP network is of a different national origin or has a different native language from you, oops, put an X in the box next to their name. The O column is for sexual orientation. So if your CHAMPs have a different sexual orientation than you, put an X in the box. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not advocating that you go out and ask people at work what their sexual orientation is um, or what their gender identity is because that will probably, at the very least, make you very unpopular and, you know, in the worst case, get you fired. Please don't do that. What I'm asking you to do is to consider for a moment that 53% of people who are LGBTQ, so uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, in the workplace, 53% are not out at work, which means you could be having roundheaded conversations at work all the time, thinking that everybody in the room has the same roundhead you do, when in fact, there are people on your team, people in your department, people that you rely on, people who are your customers, who are hiding, who are closeted, who are downplaying or covering the fact that they have a they have a different experience or identity and that, you know, you're having a roundheaded conversation and they're very much aware that they have a flathead in that conversation, but you're not. And so if you don't have anybody, if you're, let's say you're straight and you don't have anybody in your champ network with a different sexual orientation, I want you to challenge that belief because a lot of times those folks will stay quiet if they don't feel safe. And if you're, not actively making people feel safe around you, um, then you're not going to get the best work out of them. And so I bring that up here. It's true of all of these different dimensions, but I bring it up here because this is a hard one to see sometimes, but it's, 
you know, it's equally, um, it's equally important to people's experience at work. The R is for race or ethnicity. So if a person is a different race or ethnicity from you, put an X in the R column. And so the first six letters of the IGNORE model really talk about the breadth of your network. So CHAMP is about depth of your network, IGNORE up to the E is about breadth of your network. The E though is for the depth of your individual relationships. E stands for exchange, exchange of stories, exchange of values, exchange of experience or shared experiences that you have with the people in your network. And the reason this is important, so real quick, if you've had a really meaningful conversation about your values or a very vulnerable conversation about, you know, what makes you who you are, um, some defining moment in your life with the people in your CHAMP network, put an X in the box in the E column. And I'm gonna tell you while you're doing that why that's important. When you exchange stories, when you tell people more about you when you share about yourself at work that's what builds relationships and when you leave a job the relationships that you built if they're deep enough will transcend changes in your job they'll transcend changes in your industry and if you think about it, if you've been in your career for a while and maybe you've changed jobs a couple of times I'm going to bet that the people that you've kept in contact with from maybe your first job out of college or, you know, out of high school, you know, if you think back two or three jobs ago, the people that you still keep in contact with are probably the ones that you shared these kinds of stories with or that you had a shared experience that brought you closer together. And so if you want to talk about career longevity, if you want to talk about leadership and, you know, really building relationships over the long term, that E is a very important component of this work. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. The first is fill your network with diverse perspectives. So make sure you have a full champ network and then try to fill it with intentional diversity because as we know, if we only rely on our default behaviors, we're going to end up with a lot of round-headed people just like us, and we're going to miss out on learning more about the experiences of people who are different. We're going to miss out on being able to innovate and being able to build bridges across difference and being able to um, connect in places that we've never had access to before uh, and be able to bring people in in places that they've never had access to before, right? So if you're in the in-group, if you find yourself in a round-headed situation a lot of times, you know, and that changes for everybody, right? In one situation, you may have a round head, and in another situation, you may feel like Fred, where you're on the outside and you don't know how to get in, right? So when you find yourself in a round-headed conversation, think about who can I reach out to to bring in? And if you feel like you're on the outside, Look for somebody with a round head. Like when you're sitting there feeling like you've got a really flat head and you don't know how to even approach a thing, try to find somebody in that in group, in that round headed conversation that you can kind of pull off to the side and have an authentic conversation with. So that's the next part is commit to one conversation you shouldn't ignore. Have an authentic conversation, exchange stories, um, you know, try to build some bridges across difference. Ask someone. I noticed when we had the conversation the other day about the parking spots, your response was completely different from mine. I'd like to understand more about that. The last thing is to find a co-mentor to stretch your thinking. So if you've got somebody at work that every time something happens, you're on one side of, of the fence and they're on the other, that's a great opportunity to invite that person out for coffee and ask them, hey, I just want to understand where you're coming from. And you'll learn so much if you just sit and listen and not try to convince them that they're wrong. Excuse me, I have to cough. Okay, so the last piece of this is to break through from diversity to inclusion. So we've talked about, you know, making our network more diverse, making, diversifying our perspectives. But how do we be more inclusive? The first step is to think about empathy. Now, empathy means that I can imagine how someone else feels, I can put myself in their situation, and then I can adjust my own behavior accordingly. 
here's what I want you to know about empathy. Empathy is not something you're born with or something that you just one day get, right? So it's not, you know, it's not a birthmark and it's not a tattoo, okay? Empathy is a skill that you can develop over time if you put the work in. It's a skill, just like speaking in public or managing a project or learning Microsoft Excel, right? Any skill that you can learn is something that you can build on if you have the right energy, the right passion, the right drive for it. And empathy is no different. The next one is respect. Now, respect is not a skill. Respect is a responsibility. So the, what I love about respect is if someone is important to you, you will find a way to show them respect. So I want you to imagine that your boss's 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 boss invited you out for dinner and you're sitting there talking to your boss's 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 boss and they say something you completely disagree with. But you know this conversation and how you handle it is important to your career. So you're probably going to come up with a very diplomatic way to disagree without being offensive, without being dismissive, right? Now, if you can do that for your boss's 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 boss, you can also do that for the person who takes out the trash in your office. It's all a matter of will, and it's all a matter of perspective, and just coming at it with respect, just respecting another person for who they are. Now, 99 times out of 100, what the person says is not going to be super consequential. I know we're in a very charged environment right now. Politically, we're in a very charged environment. You know, some of our communities are, are very uh, fissured, and it can be very difficult to be respectful. I'm not saying that you have to sign up for someone's cause. You don't have to support their, their agenda. You don't have to donate money to their campaign, right? But you can be respectful. And if you can show someone respect who has more power than you, imagine the power that you're giving if you give someone respect who has less power than you. And it's really easy to think about this in a work context because, you know, if somebody controls your paycheck, or they control your employment, you find a way to show them respect. But if somebody doesn't have that kind of, um, that kind of power over you, can you still find ways to show them that same level of respect? And I bring this up because I worked with a guy one time for quite a while, actually. And no matter how long I worked with him, he always managed to screw up my name. And now, granted, I have a difficult last name. But he always screwed it up. And I noticed he did it with a couple of other people too. But you know what I noticed is that no matter how difficult the names were of the people who were above him in the organization, he always managed to get their names right. And I thought, well, I guess if I were CEO, he would get my name right too. And so not getting someone's name right is a sign of disrespect especially if you do it over and over and over for months at a time, no matter how many times you're corrected. If it were important to you, you would know. So I always think about that when I think about how I'm treating somebody else. If they were, you know, if they were a hiring manager, would I show them more respect? If they were responsible for my review at work, would I show them more respect? If they were my customer and I was trying to close a, a deal with them, would I show them more respect than I'm showing this individual? And if the answer is, yes, I would show them more respect, then I have some work to do because I should be treating everybody with respect, no matter whether they are, you know, valuable to me financially in that moment or just because they are another human being who's worthy of dignity. And um, you know, this is a very important thing to me because I think – too often we get very caught up in our in status and we get very caught up in appearances and we get very caught up in um, in climbing organizational ladders and we forget that you know people are people and being respectful is so important and how you treat the person who can help you the least says much much more about your character than how you treat the person who you know has a say in your future okay so here's how I'd like for you to make an impact 
in 30 days or less. Number one, I'd like for you to ask five people, when do you feel included? Now, if you can ask people who are different from you, even better, because people who are different from you will come up with a much different answer. So for me, I feel included when someone gets my name right because it shows that they took the time to ask because they actually care and they respect me as a human being and they, and they, want, they want me to feel valued. So I feel included when someone gets my name right. But everybody's answer is different. Fill your champ network and fill it with as much diversity as possible. Because again, if you're not looking for diversity, it won't happen on its own. You will tend toward your defaults and that's not leadership. And finally, have one conversation you shouldn't ignore. Reach out to someone who's different from you. Have a vulnerable conversation. Tell a story from your childhood that shaped your values. Ask them to share. Talk about a time when you felt different, when you felt like you had a flathead, When you do this, you're going to build trust. You're going to build relationships. You're going to be more productive, more effective. When people trust you, they're willing to follow you. And again, this is the work of leaders. This is important to your journey as a leader. Finally, I would like for you to consider ordering a copy of Network Beyond Bias. Now, I'm going to tell you it's a good book, and you don't have to believe me. I'm the author. I wouldn't tell you it was a good book based on my own opinion. But um, so far, I have quite a few more than are on this. I think I'm up to 15 now. Uh, Five-star reviews on Amazon, and they're not just my family and friends. Some of them are total strangers I've never met. And, um, but a lot of experts in the diversity and inclusion space have endorsed this book. A number of people who are not diversity and inclusion experts or networking experts have endorsed this book as a tool that has been valuable for them in assessing their network, in connecting with people who are different, in having the confidence to put themselves out there a little bit more, and to really inspire them to pull in more people and to be more, more deliberate in their approach to their career. The book is available on Amazon. And it's also available at networkbeyondbias.com. And while you're there, you can pick up a free download. It's a 21-page ebook with insights from the book um, that I think are some, some really nice visuals to kind of re reinforce some of these concepts. And, um, you know, pick up the copy. If you, have, um, if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read it for free on, on your Kindle. And if you buy the paperback version from Amazon, you get the Kindle edition for 99 cents. If you want bulk orders, like for your team of the book, um, come to my website for a discount on that. And signed copies are also available there. Um, again, my name is Amy C. Wanninger. I am a professional member of National Speakers Association. I speak on this and other topics around the country uh, to organizations, associations, and at conferences. And if you're interested in working with me, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn at Amy C. Wanninger or lead at any level. If you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me at amy at lead at any level.com. Again, that's amy at lead at any level.com. I want to thank you so much for your time and your attention today. I want you to network like a champ. I want you to find perspectives you would otherwise ignore. And I want you to be a leader. Thank you.